Hey everybody, welcome to episode 13, day one ready. This is our FM COVID-19 series. Thank you so much to everybody who's been following along with the series. We got another good episode lined up today. Uh, before we jump into the session, I wanna go over a couple of housekeeping items. We have muted everybody for audio quality and a full recording of this session and all the past sessions is available on IFMA's Coronavirus Resource Center. So you can go to ifma.org slash coronavirus. Now let me turn it over to Sue Thompson, who will be moderating today's session. Sue? Thanks very much. Uh, we appreciate IFMA for hosting this webinar. As usual, IFMA is the go-to place for facility managers, so thanks everyone for being here. Today our experts are going to address common misconceptions and myths about the return to facilities and provide practical advice on how to cut through the noise. And I don't know about you, but I would like some myths busted. So that's what we're gonna to do today. Uh, let me quickly introduce our panelists so that we'll have plenty of time to hear from them. Luis Morejon is the Senior Managing Director of Global Workplace Solutions for CBRE. He's a division director overseeing the Bay Area of Northern California. He was based in Madrid with Johnson Controls before moving to California. That had to be a culture shock. And has extensive experience in operations, Six, Six, Six Sigma, corporate real estate, he was a Euro FM board member, has been an IFMA member since 2006. He's a director on the IFMA Global Board of Directors, active in the Silicon Valley chapter, has presented at World Workplace. Luis has worked all over the world. It would take five minutes to read you his biography, which ought to tell you something. So suffice it to say that Luis knows what he is talking about. Next, we have Wayne Weitzel. As most of you know, Wayne is an accredited infection prevention expert and a certified environmental services technician. He's been at the forefront of providing content and guidance to IFMA throughout the pandemic. He also holds credentials as a lead AP business energy professional, is a certified green business operator. Wayne has been an active member in IFMA since 2000, and here's what, the, here's what I mean by active. IFMA's 2018 International Distinguished Member of the Year, IFMA's 2015 Associate of the Year, IFMA's 2016 Distinguished Author of the Year, Programs Chair for IFMA's Corporate Facilities Council, past president of IFMA East Bay. Wayne's recent webinar on lessons from the front lines in the war against coronavirus posted on the Corporate Facilities Council website has been viewed more than 2,000 times since it was presented a couple of months ago. Diana Steinbach is the Vice President of International Services for ISSA, the Worldwide Cleaning Industry Association. She's based in Mainz, Germany, has been in the professional cleaning industry for more than 20 years. She regularly conducts seminars and webinars for cleaning and facility management industry executives in Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, North America. And she's the former editor of the U.S. industry publications Contracting Profits, uh, Facility Cleaning Decisions, and Sanitary Maintenance Magazines. And finally, we have Cass Fontana, who is the Managing Direct Director, Government Critical Infrastructure and Capital Projects at Mighty PLC. She is a highly experienced and influential industry leader and has held a range of senior roles in property, construction, and outsourcing across a range of sectors, including defense, education, financial services, government, and science. She's very active in driving engagement and inspiring change in the built environment, a passionate promoter of technology, social impact, and diversity as drivers of long-term value. Cass is president-elect of the Royal Institute of Surveyors. Now, these are our experts. And I think that uh, this means that we're going to really hear from some folks who know what the heck they're talking about today. So first, we are going to go to Luis. And Luis, share with us your uh, global perspective from an FM perspective on what we're dealing with as we go back to work. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, everyone. I see almost 300 attendees. So thank you for joining today. This is my series. Uh, next slide. So I want to. I want to first to give you uh, this image of um, a conflict that I, I'm sure by now doesn't exist. We all think that the office will reopen and we will get back there. Uh, the point is how safely we can come back and how will be the office of the future. Next slide. 
uh, we believe there will be some trends that will uh, manifest in the next uh, after COVID. Uh, the first one is great for all, all employees, the de-densification of the office, more space, um, the hop and spot uh, portfolio strategy. Uh, as, as we all know, uh, remote work strategies are not new, but they will be more adapted and, and widely adapted by many corporations that have been resistant to that in the past. Uh, we all recognize that there will be some, there are jobs that will never be able to do 100% remotely and uh, all of us, including our own job, facility managers, uh, should be in the building, in a, in a, in a building environment. It should happen there where the, where the portfolio, where the uh, um, asset exists. And finally, the two, uh, the two last are very important as uh, um, the workplace is a silent partner of the culture of the company and, and, and the strategy. Uh, but more, more importantly, especially here in California on the, uh, in the tech hubs of the world, uh, is a very important factor for recruit, recruitment and retention uh, of the talent. Next slide. So here is the opportunity we see for the facility manager. So um, uh, overall, uh, um, for, for any uh, real estate corporate, uh, corporate real estate um, uh, professionals, uh, we have a great opportunity to uh, convey to our clients the important, uh, and by the way, external or internal client, whether you are uh, internal FM or a service provider, you have a great opportunity to uh, convey a series of questions before opening. I'm focusing in the preparation to come back. So starting from facing how the workplace would look, uh, how would be the journey of that employee when they come back, what baggage they bring after this period of being at home, separated from their team. A screening, I think there would, there, there would be other panelists talk, talking about that. Uh, the protocols to, uh, uh, that you would need to put in place, both for cleaning, maintenance, um, welcoming, how you will provide those services, uh, what kind of protection you will give to your employees, how will your supply chain will work uh, before opening and throughout the process um, over, uh, over probably months or, or years, depending on how long this will last until we have the vaccine or a solution to, uh, to, the, to this uh, pandemic. Um, and finally, uh, very important, the communication, how, how we as a facility managers and, and the company itself will keep the communication to our employees through uh, technology, using technology. I think that would be key uh, to get 100% uh, uh, communication both ways to um, our workforce during this coming back to the office. Next slide, please. Uh, we believe there will be a, a four gu guiding principles that we need to follow. Obviously, first is safety. We should, first of all, take care of our employees because I think that those are the ones that come in first to the office, especially at the beginning. Uh, many corporations, certainly CBRE, don't think that visitors or uh, type of tours or um, big meetings will happen. Uh, so we need to have that, that in mind. Uh, to start with uh, compliance, we need to think about what 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 the regulations are. What kind of if you are in a multi-tenant uh, building, what kind of regulation that the, the the landlord will will put in in, in those buildings, and what are, what are basically the um the, the law in in different countries and, and in different places that you would need to follow. Collaboration all over the place with the the inside. Uh, the company and outside with all the stakeholders that needs to have uh, that touch the workplace and especially with, and, and, and this is important for facility managers and assets or property managers in, in multi-tenant buildings when you would need, I mean, I would never seen, I have never seen so much collaboration between the two groups, the internal FM that, that provide services to the workforce in, in the space and the property managers that take care of the uh, build and, and, and the multi-tenant buildings in, in those cases. And finally, agility. This is a fluid situation, so we don't know what, what will happen if there would be a, a, a comeback some, somewhere in autumn. So be mindful that whatever you're taking actions now, especially a lot of corporations that are opening, 
uh, in July, after the 4th of July week will be a big opening for many, many, many companies and all over the world. Uh, I think uh, you need to be ready to step back if necessary or uh, speed up if necessary, uh, uh, depending on how the situation progresses. Next slide. I think this is my last slide to, to open it for, for my opening remarks. But in, in order to plan in for that return, there are three main dimensions that you as facility managers need to take in consideration. The community readiness uh, is talking about those external factors that I, am, I was speaking before, the government orders, the county, the, 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 the state or the country. So you need to uh, know all what is happening around you and what are the regulations that allow you to do or not to do uh, things in your workplace, as well as uh, your uh, uh, ca capacity for to tap into your supply chain. Uh, the facility itself, the readiness, hopefully many of landlords or owners or even uh, um, uh, uh, occupiers have taken care of the building during this stop between brackets. Uh, I know many facility managers here will uh, rely on the comments that we, have, we haven't stopped during this uh, four months, but certainly the building has uh, ha, the buildings have been haven't been used properly as we normally use with no occupant. So we need to have the, the building ready to receive the workforce. And the last one, very important but not least, is the employee readiness. How to plan? How to communicate them? How? What way they will come? Uh, what will be the phase? Uh, which shift there will be in, t in, in case you decide to spread the, um, how to come to the office. Um, the communication to the at-risk employees and, and, and the voluntarily approach for them to come. So these three uh, dimensions would be important for facility managers to take in, to take in consideration before opening the, the workplace. Sue, back to you. That's excellent information, Luis. Thank you, um, folks. We will have some. We will have time for some questions at the end. I hope so. Please hang on to those, and um, and we will get to those because right now it's it's Wayne's turn. Wayne, uh, tell us the perspective from Mr. Clean. That's that's who you are. So let's go with you. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, Mr. Disinfect to you. Um, there is a difference. That's one of the big things here. Um, I, I will say uh, I'm going to be brief here because I do want to leave time for comments at the end. Um, I also want to say that the next speaker, Diana, and I are kind of of the same mind on this, so I don't want to steal her thunder. I think it's important to hear from somebody in uh, Diana's position with ISSA and hear the comments she's going to make from uh, from her her role. Uh, I think is going to be very interesting to solidify some of this stuff. Um, basically, j just to let everybody know, I've, I've disinfected hundreds of sites since the beginning of March and uh, spent a lot of time consulting with uh, dozens of leadership teams around the country. I, I, I mean, I do probably one or two a day uh, on average and helping them navigate through this process. And I find that most of the time I'm separating fact from fiction in these conversations. Um, it's almost like there's a carnival sideshow that develops around everything in our world. <laughs> you know, we had the, the, the main event, right, the big top, but then this massive sideshow develops around it. And that's what we've got. We've, we've got this uh, kind of drawing people away from the rudiments. And, and, and this is a rudiment issue. This is a meat and potatoes cleaning and disinfection issue. Um, it, it, the uh, emerging technologies that we're hearing about, you know, that's great that we're, we're, we're looking for those, but that's not what we need now. We need to go back to rudiment cleaning and disinfection um, and, and really stay away from some of this stuff that's, that's pulling our resources, time, and uh, attention away from that. Uh, I'll start with one thing, you know, uh, coatings is a question I, I hear a lot about, and I've kind of throttled my comments and been, you know, nice, uh, diplomatic about it. I'm just going to come out and tell you, you don't need to waste your time with coatings. Um, there is a recent study that, that was out in 2017 uh, that was extensively done on, on coatings that claim to, quote, kill COVID for 90 days on the surface. Um, Kaiser Hospitals in 2015 banned the use of such coatings in all of their facilities. Um, they're not regulated by the EPA or the FIFRA um, and have very limited capability. They're actually designed to be antimicrobial for the surface, not for the human being touching them. If you look into the 
shoot them. So uh, right now, I wouldn't invest too much time, effort, and money in coatings. Um, I know some people are going to get angry that I said that, especially the people that sell and apply those coatings. Um, but I, if anybody wants, I can send them the studies and direct them to those areas. So that's the first issue. The second is to understand pathway of transmission. So the number one, by, by orders of magnitude, ways that, that things get transmitted, and, uh, that the virus gets transmitted, is by respiratory aerosol. That's the number one way. Now, way, 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 way down on here is surface transmission. That means if I cough, it lands on a, on a what we call fomite, it lands on a, a surface, and then someone else touches that surface and puts their hand in their mouth, the chances of them getting the, the, the virus from that pathway is far less than direct aerosol. So, it, it, you know, apply the Pareto principle. 80% of your efforts should be directed toward preventing aerosol transmission, number one, okay, by a long shot. Um, and then I also get a lot of questions about soft seating. I've had some people actually say, Wayne, we're going to replace all of our soft seating with, quote, bleach cleanable seating. Um, that's too far of a pendulum swing um, and, and too violent of a reaction, I think, to what we're, we're seeing here. Um, I actually uh, have interviewed uh, some IHs, industrial hygienists, on the soft seating, and their studies have shown that soft seating will actually prevent transmission more than uh, slick surface seating because it grabs the virus and doesn't release it as well. So this is coming from a CIH um, who, who has studied this stuff. Uh, I don't think you need to get rid of your soft seating. Uh, I think that uh, basic rudiment cleaning and sanitization of, of, of upholstery, I think is certainly going to be effective. And I have a couple of studies that claim that as well that are actually uh, peer reviewed and have, have some background to them. And then lastly, I get a lot of questions about UV. Um, UV is definitely works on disinfection. It's just, can it be scalable and efficient and productive for the built environment in which we work in? How are you going to disinfect with UV in a high density space? How are you going to prevent shadowing where the UV doesn't reach items behind your monitor or whatever? Um, but technologies are emerging there to deal with airflow and, and UV. I think there's some opportunities there for, uh, for redirected safe UV. But as far as robotic UV and things like that, that's down the road, and, and if that technology develops, great. But right now, it's the process of rudimentary cleaning and disinfection that we need to focus on. Next slide, please. So what should scare you? <laughs> well, there's a, there's, there's a few things, but uh, number one for me in terms of things are, uh, what are we spraying in our facilities? We're at a crossroads right now where tens of thousands of gallons of something is going to be brought into your facilities and sprayed with a frequency never seen before. And what is that? Uh, and we don't know the implications of it right now because most of this disinfection has occurred in empty facilities. People haven't been around to smell it or to get affected by it. And I, I, um, I have yet, and I can say this with complete honesty, I have yet to speak to a facility manager in all these conversations who had viewed the SDS of that product before talking to me. Instead, we call it up on the screen live and say, oh, this is what they're using. This is what the janitor is using. I call it up and I show them. We walk through the SDS and they're horrified to see what, what's being sprayed in their facility. So I think there needs to be a definite focus. This is what scares me the most, that no one's looking at SDS and labeling. You need to look at both, the SDS and the product label. And you as an FM have to know how to look at those items. And Sue, Sue and I might put on a, a class for CFC maybe on how to, how to read an SDS. Um, but that's important for you to know what's being sprayed. And I, I got a question once. Somebody saw a picture of us applying some product in a facility for disinfection, and they said, why aren't you wearing Tyvek? And I, I said, well, why would we want to wear Tyvek? It, if somebody has to wear Tyvek to spray it down, you have to ask the question, what are they spraying? You know, is it the method maybe that they don't want to get aerosolized, you know, powered uh, spray on themselves? Or is it the product? Do you really want that being sprayed in your facility? So there are safer disinfectants that have better SDS levels. Look for those and choose those, but definitely read the SDS before deploying anything, anything in your facility. Um, and then the other thing too is, is there's a lot of uh, spraying and, and fogging going on right now with products that are never meant to be sprayed or fogged. It's, they're not labeled for that kind of use. So you have to look at that as well. And, and um, there's a lot of people buying, have bought electrostatic sprayers and are planning on using those in your occupied buildings. That's a little scary. So you, you, need to, you need to understand how this stuff is supposed to be applied according to labeling and how it's supposed to be applied during occupied hours. Um, 
and I'm, I'm shocked too at how little industrial hygienists have been consulted during this. I, I, again, I have not spoken to a single FM who has talked to an IH. And this is what IHs live and breathe and exist for is this dynamic right now. So uh, if there is any question that you guys have, an IH is somebody that's going to come at this pure. No, they're not selling any snake oil. They're coming in and they want to help. Um, and then lastly, the janitorial skill set. Um, as you all know in FM, the, the number two complaint most of you get next to hot and cold calls is janitorial related. And that, that's obviously because it's such a large contract. And there's so many points of failure. But the questions I get from FMs are, Wayne, if my contractor can't even handle the basic scope now, and I'm going to add this on top of it, how can I guarantee they're going to do this? So there's going to have to be a lot of training and auditing going on to ensure the janitorial model meets the, the threshold. Next slide, last slide. So evidence-based approach. Um, uh, there's not you know, a lot of evidence right now, which is, has been a fluid situation. The CDC has certainly proven uh, their uh, ability to change uh, guidance. But um, one thing we do know is masks. Masks, masks, masks. The number, if you want to do the number one way to prevent the spread of this virus, wear a mask and distance yourself. So the more you can wear a mask, it, it, the more you're going to prevent that respiratory aerosolized transmission, which is, again, the number one way this gets transmitted. And the second is using countermeasures. People are going to be touching your front door, person after person after person. How are you going to disinfect that front door? It's not realistic. You need to have hand sanitizing stations right in the front door. That's a countermeasure for them to reset their baseline once they come into the front door. So what countermeasures do you have in place to limit potential issues and hotspots in your facility to, to mitigate that? Um, and one thing I want to talk about is managing your own level of risk. Uh, we had a class yesterday with Dr. Michelle Osman for the Corporate Facilities Council. She had a great graph that showed throughout a person's day how the risk level increases and decreases depending on where they're traveling and going. You know, they're going out to a bar, they're taking public transport. Well, that can function inside your facility too. Very low risk in your private office or in your, 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 your benching area that has nobody around you. But the minute you go out and go to the kitchenette, all of a sudden, your risk level goes higher. So you need to say, I'm about ready to step away from my desk. I'm going to mask up. I'm going to go to the kitchenette. I'm not going to touch my eyes or my nose after doing everything. I'm going to wash my hands after and come back. There has to be personal responsibility. Codings won't take personal responsibility out of the equation. You have to have that. Um, and finally, you know, a couple more option points here is, is optics. There's a, there's a lot of people doing this for the optics, and I understand that. I had one client that asked us to spray a deodorizer down with the disinfectant because they wanted their internal clients to say, oh, something was done. But we don't recommend disinfectants, especially here in California. I'm sorry, not disinfectants, deodorizers. Um, so there's a lot of people that want the optics, and I understand that. And I think that does make sense when you're bringing people back to this facility for the first time, telling them you did a CDC disinfection, I think, is helpful in that regard. But going forward, we need to focus less on flash and more on rudiments. And then finally, you know, what are the frequencies? I had one client say, hey, can you clean this every 15 minutes? I said, well, why? Why do you need this to be disinfected every 15 minutes? What science, what evidence do you have that says that? Um, and, and, and does that make sense? So we're really big on diagnostics, things like uh, ATP testing, UV markers, things like that to set baseline frequencies that someone needs to do in their facility uh, to keep the threshold under something acceptable. So I'm big on evidence-based, collect it from day one if you're an FM, and then start trending it. So that way you can uh, scale once you start increasing your occupancy levels. So that's my pitch. We're leaving plenty of time for questions if I didn't get to something you had a question about. Well, as usual, I, I love the, uh, the practicality of, of that approach. And so, Diana, we're going to ask you to come, come in on the heels of that and provide your perspective. Well, it's, it's tough to follow Mr. Disinfection, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. So, um, you know, I think what we often need to do right now in a lot of the conversations that I'm having around the world with people like yourselves is um, is really try to break this down. I think we all need to take a deep cleansing breath and look at the situation because there's the pressure of getting business started. There's the reality that the virus is still out there and it won't be going away anytime soon. Um, but this can be a manageable task, I guarantee it. And that's why I wanted to start with some of the basics. So 
first of all, let's remember that basic cleaning steps that have been done in your facility all along without any disinfecting on top of it have a certain level of effectiveness already at reducing the risk of an enveloped virus like this SARS-CoV-2. And I think we also need to do something a little bit cleansing right now. We need to take a little truth serum. We're amongst friends. And we need to remember the last time before the pandemic that one of your team or a cleaning service provider came to you and said, I think you need to be looking at some of these cleaning measures for protecting health. And your answer might have unfortunately been, we don't have the money for that. Let's do more with less. So let's all just accept it and realize that it's a new day. <laughs> and if you were at that level, then you may need to be getting yourself to an acceptable level of cleaning for the basics first before you even start adding disinfecting on. Um, and But that's OK, because let me tell you, we have a study that um, I'm happy if you connect with me on LinkedIn, I can share this with you. But um, where a hundred person office put a few bits of, of non-infectious bacteria on some people's hands and they decided to see what it looked like over time. Within four hours, the entire office had the bacteria spread throughout it. So this is why frequencies are important of the basics. Um, but the good news with the same study was that all they did was a little hand hygiene, extra training, and they did a little bit more on cleaning on the high touch surfaces and they had surface reduction of the virus uh, or the bacteria at the time by over 60%. And so when they looked at that with actual human coronavirus, that was able to reduce by almost by more than 80% uh, in terms of the possibility of infection. So just doing the basics without any of the crazy other stuff that Wayne was telling you you may not need can really make a difference. But are you there yet? So we might need to get there. Um, and that's why I say we don't want what I call cleaning theater. You don't need to do overkill disinfecting. You don't need to be doing all this crazy, shiny investment and stuff just to show somebody that you care. Um, so let's get to the next slide and let's talk about what we can do that's more realistic. All right, so let's just assume we're gonna have to change the scope of work at some point here um, to, to address what you're trying to accomplish. What is your goal? Are you trying to minimize employees sick days um, because that has an absenteeism bottom line cost? Or are you trying to reassure customers to get them to return? Because that may require different tactics. But let's just talk about disinfection. The reality is if you ask somebody to, dis to disinfect the same surfaces, it will take longer because of dwell time. If you want it to work, don't pay for it if you're not going to give it time to work. Um, but that means that you're going to have to invest in more time or more people to get the same space covered. Um, and so you have to determine how are we gonna get that done? Um, you also have to understand that as soon as that is clean, the next thing or person that comes into that environment could possibly contaminate it. And so there is no silver bullet, but you can minimize risk responsibly. Um, now, if you're gonna ask occupants to wipe down things themselves or use hand sanitizer, think of the implications of how are you gonna keep that stocked? I've been in places where the, the hand sanitizer was out and the sign said, I have to use it before I walk in the door. Um, you have to keep that in mind. And you also have to look at what is the traffic pattern of those occupants in your building? Walk in their shoes and see what they do and touch and you'll have a better idea of where you need to focus your time. Um, and then of course also, we're talking about, this is day one now, right? You're open, what you planned and what you implement could be different. So make sure that you are realistic about is this working in practice and do I need to do something different? Um, and then of course you wanna talk about the ROI. So, you know, look at some of the numbers you can, you can gather to help justify what you might have to invest in right now. What's the cost of employees that are out sick or quarantined? Um, what is the customer contribution analysis if you bring shoppers or restaurant guests back faster? Um, what do you lose? What's the cost of losing loyal customers to the competition because they were, clearer in their communications about how they were protecting health. You can go to the next slide. All right, so once you've gone through what scope of work are we looking at changing, you're gonna get back to some of the things that Wayne was talking about. What technologies are out there? Everything's coming at you. There is no 100% guarantee, just like everything else in our lives. Um, but I would say the things that you need to look at are efficacy data, and uses and instructions, because that's gonna give you the insights in between the lines. So some technology is newer and might not have even had time to be registered, especially for this virus. 
And some technology isn't even tested by governments under a disinfectant claim. It doesn't mean it doesn't work, but it means you need to do your homework first. So once you've got claims in writing, which you always should do, look at those tests. If they're saying that we've tested this on viruses, is it the same kind of coronavirus category that we're talking about now? Not all bugs are the same. And is it on the same surfaces um, that you're using? If it was working well in air and water, that doesn't mean it's gonna work with what you're talking about. Um, and does it disinfect or, or deactivate the virus in the kind of time you're looking for? When you look at usage, you also need to look at things like um, misting and fogging is not the same as electrostatic spraying. And um, so look at the difference and decide, what am I trying to use this for? Am I using this because it's supposed to be done in front of people? Then it cannot be the kind of chemical that the manufacturer says has to be used in an unoccupied space. You got to read the lines. Um, you know, we had one retailer that had a problem where they had surfaces that were velvety, no glass above the jewelry, um, and they can't spray disinfectant. So they were having to look at something like a UV light, but then they realized, okay, well, um, we have to be careful because, again, if it doesn't shine in all the nooks and crannies, it's not going to work in all the nooks and crannies. So they had to be realistic about different methods they had to use in their facility. Um, also with training. You all are focused on bloodborne pathogen training to meet the health and safety regulations in your local area. Why wouldn't you ask the people that are cleaning in your building right now if they are specifically trained to handle this coronavirus? It is just as deadly as a bloodborne pathogen could be. Um, and so ask for that proof of training and make sure that it's specific to what they're trying to do for you right now. And of course, if you're going to get a referral, ask if that person has actually tested the claim themselves. Why do they say that it worked in their facility? Because someone told them it was working or because they did the due diligence themselves? Um, because that kind of CYA right now is gonna make you feel better when you see all this stuff out there to know that your choices are actually realistic and proper, even if they're not as flashy as the next guy. My last slide, please. Um, so, okay, so now you've gotten all this way. Now you have to look at how am I communicating my plans to my people? How are we going to execute this? Because communication can be where it's where it succeeds or it fails after all the work you put in. And what's my plan? So 90% of you or more are going to be in a type of facility that needs basic cleaning and disinfecting. That's it. Not hospital grade crazy. Um, but if you do have a case that comes into your building, which can happen once we get back in there, then how do I know how to escalate it to the right people who are trained to decontaminate? And how do I make sure that I can manageably address it with least disruption to work or be prepared? I might have to disrupt the operations in order to do this right. So don't try to rush when you know there's been a case in your building. And when it comes to validation, a lot of people are creating their own plans. They've got great marketing teams coming up with great names for it, um, but they're essentially self-verifying. So it's important for you to say, how have they been validated by a third party? Now, ISSA has a pandemic division and they've created a, a facility accreditation, which IFMA has endorsed. Um, and we're one of many, so you need to do your due diligence with that too. But the reality is, is we have people who've spent decades creating occupant protocols for protection during SARS, MERS, Ebola, and they've created something that can work on a global scale for any kind of facility. Um, so, so that's why we're confident to bring that out to help people like yourselves. Um, you can look into more details. I think there'll be something that you'll be getting after the webinar where you can find out more about it if that's what you're looking for. But lastly, with com customer communication, um, you really have to remember, confidence doesn't just come from seeing what you've done. Confidence comes from hearing it. And so you could have a few changes to your scope of work and a few changes to your other, you know, uh, occupancy, um, touchless systems, things like that. And if you communicate those heavily enough, you don't have to go crazy with your investments and changes and you can have the same impact. So signage on doors, check-in points, reception counters, door hangers, window or mirror clings, table tent cards, saying what you did when they weren't seeing it themselves can just just be as powerful and do it as often as you can because you can never under communicate how you're trying to protect people. Thank you very much.
All right. Well, the great thing is that you guys are managing to answer several of the questions that are already being submitted because this is how fabulous you are. And that's exactly why you were chosen as presenters. So now, Kath, it's your turn. Wrap this up. Tell us, tell us what you're looking at from your perspective. I, I think you're going to hit some technology issues, if I'm not mistaken. Please take it away. Thank you, Sue, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, good afternoon from the UK, anyway. Um, and I think I'm not quite sure what time zone everybody else is on, but isn't it amazing to be able to talk to a global audience? And it's been really, really interesting li listening to the different perspectives um, from across across the pond, uh, how different uh, this is being tackled, actually. So I'm, I'm going to talk um, a bit more about how technology can build confidence. And I think confidence is a thing that facilities managers, as we call them in the UK, need to provide more than anything uh, to our clients. Um, so thanks. So next slide, please. So the six considerations um, that we think that um, organisations actually need to look at um, and the first one, um, for us anyway, in the UK, is that this is absolutely not business as usual. Um, we have a legal requirement now in the UK to undertake a COVID risk assessment, and facilities are required now to uh, display a COVID secure certificate, which is validated by the UK's health and safety executive. So we've got a really regulated environment that we're already working in. So those assessments have to be done by law. But in those assessments and in the, the assessment of the portfolio, we suggest that colleague performance and well-being really needs to be considered, not just the cost of ownership or the cost, indeed, of uh, facilities. We feel that adapting the workplace and the facilities management regime is really critical, but also not to forget colleagues continuing to work from home. Um, certainly here in the UK, a huge percentage of people are still working from home. Um, and, and actually, as the facilities manager, we still have responsibility for those people as well. Wherever people are, though, all colleagues must be confident in the measures put in place to protect them. Um, and this is where we're seeing some really interesting trends. So some of our customers have prepared their buildings, uh, done everything you've talked about, communicated um, and, and really put the effort in to make their property COVID secure, as we call it. And yet very few people are actually returning to the workplace. Um, so people are voting with their feet not to come back into the workplace, um, which is a big concern, actually, because uh, there's lots of good reasons to be in the workplace. Um, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But a couple of other recommendations we have. Um, the sustainability agenda is still really important. And once we're through the COVID crisis, we will still have the climate change crisis to deal with. So whilst it's not top of mind today, um, hopefully we'll be through this in 12 months or so, and then we've still got climate change to really grab hold of. So I think if we can include the sustainability agenda in all the things we're thinking about now, uh, energy management, travel considerations, et cetera, um, that would be really positive. And then finally, um, which is what I'm gonna come on to, is adopting technology uh, to improve organizational agility, enhance safety, um, get some savings actually out of this process and, and very, very importantly, evidencing control and communicating with our colleagues effectively. So that's where we see technology can really help. So um, I think, Diana, you, you really touched on this, that people need to see the change to feel reassured. And more than that, actually, people need to feel that they are in some control of what is going on. Um, so um, we really do recommend visible cleaning operatives in pre-decontaminated high footfall areas. Um, we think that the visibility of the cleaning professional is really important. And of course, providing those additional hand sanitizers. We had a huge um, problem in the UK early on uh, on the availability of hand sanitizer, but now it's freely available again, as no doubt you guys did, freely available again. So let's provide as much of that as we can. Um, from a health and safety and well-being, uh, we recommend that cloakroom and lockers are reduced to an absolute minimum, uh, that screens, uh, fixed and mobile, are put in place to prevent contamination, floor signage, one-way systems, um, everything we can possibly to do to reduce rather than mitigate the risk, and then of course spacing of chairs, signage and floor marking to keep the two metre distance, which I think you guys have six feet, we have a two metre requirement at the moment, although 
that is very debatable. Um, there's a big campaign in the UK to reduce that to one metre. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So all the signs we've created for two metres and we've now put in, we might have to change them all again. Um, from a water and a waste perspective, uh, we need to provide waste receptacles for contaminated PPE. Um, in the UK, masks are mandated on public transport now. Whether they'll be mandated in the, the workplace is yet to be seen, but a lot of our customers are mandating that. So we need to maintain a, a separation of waste receptacles for that. And then security, uh, monitoring body temperature of individuals as they enter a building, um, having hygiene stewards in place to support colleagues. It's very hard uh, to remember all the things you need to do in the new workplace. Keep your distance, don't touch this, don't touch that, bring your own this, bring your own that. We are recommending that, that we have people in place to support at least um, the transition period. Um, we think that in a lot of our buildings we're going to have a real problem with queues, um, especially queues for elevators. Um, so we need to put in additional security or concierge to support people in a queue because human beings, you know, we don't like to be kept waiting and we want to get on, we're all really busy, but we need to maintain the social distancing. And then um, handheld fe fever check devices and really importantly, um, control um, and recording of that data. So these are all things that, you know, we need to look at. And the benefits of the physical changes we need to put in place um, for the future, uh, physical change, we think encourages cultural change. So people can see that the workplace has physically changed. That means their behaviour and their attitudes should change as well. Um, so we do recommend um, surface coating, um, notwithstanding what Wayne has said. Um, we are using products that have been certified, um, are um, compliant with our regulations, the control of substances um, hazardous to health. And we do recommend using those as an additional measure. Um, people should be provided with welcome back preventative equipment and, and personal equipment kit and we're going to give everybody a five day supply as they come into the building. Um, I think fixed thermal screening with face recognition is becoming uh, a feature of some of our more high tech buildings but importantly trying to completely remove the risk so automatic touchless doors, turnstile or footfall sensors to stop too many people coming into buildings and, and occupancy monitoring of those sites. And we think the benefits of that are a really smooth visitor experience and an employee experience. Ease of access into our buildings is a real challenge, especially in some of our high rise, which have got a narrow way in and a narrow way out, and you can't get in without going into the lifts. That's really important. Um, we need to minimize the risk of overcrowding and breaching our social distancing rules. Um, reducing the risk from contact with our own people, uh, we have a duty of care for them and fundamentally reducing the risk of COVID-19 spread and enhancing the safety of all our employees. Thank you. Thanks, so, Kath. I, I, really, I really like your, your idea of uh, hygiene monitors. That, that's, I hadn't thought about that, and that's an excellent suggestion. Um, and I'm just gonna throw, I'm just gonna throw in here that I, I think we all know that as the summer goes on and more research is compiled, I, I hope by the end of the summer going into fall, we'll have a whole lot of research on, um, you know, how, how to address this, how the behavior of the virus, all of these different things. So let's keep in mind that as we move forward and as we return to work, some of us aren't returning to work until the fall or even after, that there will be a lot more to, um, to, to gather information with and from. So we've, we've got some, We've got some good panelists here who have given us some great practical information about that. So we do have some questions, and um, the, here's a couple of questions that have come in. One from Cheryl Duvall, who says, we are receiving questions from facility managers asking what corridor width is safe for two-way travel. And as a sort of connected question, Mark Young asks, can you address the practice or the idea of one-way hallways and stairwells. It's a popular thing that some companies are doing, but what about the increased distances needed to travel from point A to point B, back to point A, and the corresponding exposure for the longer path of travel? Um, I think if I could throw that to Luis and to Kath as you consider those two questions. Uh, Luis, how do you view that? Yeah, well, we, we what we are doing right now, and one of the questions I put at the beginning was, 
what will happen with our workplace, how it will change, and how the, um, the traffic inside that workplace will, will take place as we come back. First of all, the first thing is to those uh, um, people that ask, that, that at the beginning at least, there will be less occupancy. So we will have less people um, moving around the office. So it would be easier to um, uh, signage the traffic and going around only one way, using the elevator. I think Cal, uh, Calvin mentioned that in the, in the right way with people and concierge uh, managing that. Uh, at the beginning in, in those um, narrow places to go up and down or move in. Uh, obviously, when you are in a floor 46 that uh, Wayne helped us to clean recently, is a different thing. You need to use the elevator mostly, or you need to use, you cannot use the stairs, but there are ways to, um, to organize the traffic. We're using uh, signage on the floor uh, in order to only have one one uh, way to to movement uh, the the movement on one way so you 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 will not uh, meet people on the way out especially when you go uh, to uh, your uh, cafe or small cafe or or your uh, the, the the toilets or the restrooms that that kind of uh, multi um, touch points uh, uh, in the office that you you need to go time to time uh, so I I would recommend. To, I mean, if I even have uh, issue some some uh, practice um, documentation about signage in the office, so I recommend to go there and find. And also the carpet producers, so many of them have already uh, have already uh, given their own uh, products, so you can literally put in the office and 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 one day to the other, just following Kathleen uh, um, uh, pictogram that she presented, how to move around the office. So that that would be our 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 recommendation. Yeah, I think um, from my perspective, uh, clearly you know there's an easy mathematical answer that says that if you've got two people and they need to maintain two meters, you probably need a corridor of at least six meters, which is you know buildings are not designed like that, so that's not viable. Um, I think we do also have to remember that uh, I think you rightly said Sue, the science is um, developing all the time and. You know, um, certainly the advice we're getting in the UK is that you need to be in rather close contact, less than two metres for more than 15 minutes uh, in order to really be at risk. So the first thing is that people who are um, clinically vulnerable probably shouldn't be in the office in the first place. Um, so let's assume that those people are not there, uh, unless they really have to be. But assuming they're not there, then the rest of us, I think, um, we need to avoid contact. Um, but the, if it is unavoidable, then as long as it's under 15 minutes, and preferably if you're wearing a face covering, then I think we can probably manage it. But it is going to require um, human consideration. We're going to have to be considerate people, um, and we're going to have to start thinking about you know, our impact on other people. Uh, something that we've um, recently, uh, I know the panel is not mad on gadgets, but uh, we've recently purchased for a client uh, wristbands that everybody in the office will wear, and as somebody comes within two meters of you, it will buzz. So you'll get a, a little buzz to say you're too close to me. And I think little gadgets like that, you know, it's a bit, it is a bit um, gimmicky, but they're quite useful reminders. It's behavior we have to change, not buildings. We cannot change buildings to an adequate level to stop any risk, but behaviors can change. And things like visual aids, little gadgets and absolutely that sense of consideration for others I think is what is really important so I don't think you'll be widening all your corridors to six to eight meters I think the focus needs to be on the people not on the space uh, actually at the point of self-disclosure I had the virus in January I thought it was a severe cold it was a very severe cold and I took four days off but I went to work because that's what we do when we think we just have a cold and uh, no one in my office got sick. And I, I have to chalk that up to my great hygiene. I don't cough in people's faces. I didn't shake their hands or hug them or kiss them. I stayed in my little corner. And behavior is everything. Kath, you're absolutely right. Um, we do have another question here um, that is just really, really telling. Um, Diana, you spoke to um, uh, ha asking about the janitorial teams training and what they've been doing. Wayne and uh, Diana, do you 
do you um, recommend giving extra training on infection control to facility teams, or should we leave it up to our janitorial folks? Wayne, how about you first? Um, actually, I, Diana, could you go first on that one? I think you had something to say. I think you were raising your hand earlier. Um, sure. Just before I answer that, one thing um, that I just want to add when it comes to behavior is we talk a lot about wearing masks, but our experts who are used to protecting in all sorts of nasty environments, they, they use a phrase with when they teach children, and it's worked for the adults too, is cover all the holes. So we're used to the mouth and the nose, but um, our experts are also saying that if you can wear glasses and all four, <laughs> all five of us are wearing glasses by chance, if you can wear glasses in the office, it's it's actually something you should encourage people to do when they're out and about because because they forget that it can actually come through their eyes as well. So that's just one thing I wanted to throw out there. We don't need to be alarmist, but if they can, it's probably better for them. Um, and it keeps you from sticking your fingers in your eyes when your glasses are in the way. Um, in terms of training, I think that what we're advocating for is that you need to have someone on your in-house team that understands this virus and understands what it takes to address it, because then you're an informed customer. Um, and of course, any teams that are going to be providing any kind of cleaning uh, measures should be trained and not just in regular cleaning, but also have the basics. Um, with human nature, when people understand why they're doing a task, they're more apt to follow it. So when the cleaning workers understand why they are doing certain things for reducing the risk of COVID-19, they're going to do that better. Um, and there's simple training. We've got training, there's plenty of training out there in different countries um, that's specific to what do you do for the basics right now? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the way the janitorial industry works is they think in terms of FTEs. And this is not just a matter of saying, okay, there's, as Diana mentioned earlier, it's a function of time um, that we need to throw more bodies at this. Um, it, it's, if those bodies still aren't doing the correct things, what's the point? So the training is critical, but in some cases, what I would say is probably what's more effective is auditing. There needs to be uh, more handholding. There needs to be working alongside the crews. There needs to be going back and checking. Now, I do like UV markers for this, but I, I, I hate you, you guys. At FMs have maybe put a paper clip or an M and M on the floor to see if your carpet's getting vacuumed. I think every FM's done that, right? Um, it, well, the, the UV marker is the surface equivalent of that, but you could get really UV happy as an FM and take it too far. Um, a partial wipe of UV is fine. You have to retake. I just so you guys know you take a UV marker, mark a surface, then go back and look after the cleaning to see if it's been removed or partially removed. A partial is still okay in, in many cases for disinfecting. Um, but I, I think if you do something like that with a with you know an IH firm does that, we do that. We offer that diagnostic service to our clients as well uh, to train their staff. But um, honestly, we've been hired to, to do stainless steel cleaning training with janitorial companies and that was like pulling teeth it was it took a lot to get them just to learn how to clean stainless steel correctly in some environments so it's going to take it, it it's going to take some uh, repeated training i believe not just one time can i just add something here so i think um generally um facilities managers need to be uh displaying the highest standards here I think we should be the kind of the benchmark for um, how we need to behave in the new environment and, and what things need to happen so I think we do need training actually um, we need we need to really role model um, the best possible way to um, operate in the new environment and our, I think our services need to be absolutely on point especially in the um, what you call janitorial we would just call cleaning but also HVAC security every single part of our service value chain has got to be absolutely on point um, because any bit of it that falls over i think will damage the whole um what we're trying to create uh, which is that confidence in what we do so i think training is really crucial actually and, and one thing to, to add on to that kath is that um, if anybody's ever heard Dr. Dean Kashiwagi speak, he talks about uh, how you contract subject matter experts. There's a lot of people paying the piper right now. It's a lot of peas. A lot of people paying the piper right now who have contracted low cost uh, uh, vendors who are not subject matter experts who they can't turn to and say, how could, what should I be looking for? How can I do this? Instead, you just got low cost vendors. 
So this is definitely a case to have SMEs in your back pocket as an FM right now. Yeah. And another thing too, we're seeing a lot of people popping up, pest control companies, asbestos removal companies who suddenly are coming to us and saying, I want to know how to clean for COVID-19 because the police department just gave me the job to clean everything there. And we just think, oh my goodness, what were they thinking? But, you know, there's a lot of people who are coming out and saying, well, if I can get rid of cockroaches, I can get rid of the virus. And it comes back to show me the proof that you know what you're doing and show me how long you've been doing this. If they just rocked up to your door and said, I can do it for you first, you know, keep walking, please. I mean, you really want to make sure it's somebody and trust the people that you've been working with. I mean, you trusted your instincts then, trust your instincts now with your business partners and they will go get what they don't know for you if you ask them a question. Well, I, I want to say that we've been, since I joined this industry, we've been trying to get to the sea level. Guess what? We are now at sea level. We, we have become important, critically important. That's what I said is a great opportunity for facility managers in the broader sense of the uh, concept, starting from the janitorial, to, as Kathleen said, to the crew, the, the, the hospitality, the security. All of that right now is at sea level, and we need to perform at that level right now. So let's use this opportunity. And yeah. I would I would add to that too, you know, like like you were just saying, Luis, we've been waiting for a chance for somebody a few like not just a notch higher to listen, but at the exact top. And there are business owners, CEOs, heads of marketing that need to get a message to their customers because their customers need it to feel secure. And your message is the message they can take. This is the first time in most of our careers where our message can be taken straight through the customer's customer and they want it. So as long as you're responsible about what you give them as a message, this is going to have long lasting effect on your loyalty with each other and your success and their long term sustained investment in what you do, not just a short investment. Wow, I, I couldn't have asked for a better a better way to, to close this out. This, this is excellent. And as I'm sure you all understand, we've gotten a bunch of questions. We can't get to all of them. So we encourage you to reach out to our panelists via LinkedIn. Uh, certainly, if you would like to speak to them personally, contact IFMA and get their information because uh, this has been some really, really good practical information today. And I think we can truly appreciate it. Thank you for all the great questions that have already come in. And again, reach out to the panelists if you have specific ones. Chris, I'm going to hand it back over to you. You got to mute. You got to mute, Chris. Chris. Uh, thank you for a great job moderating. Uh, and thank you to the panelists. Uh, great insight. Um, and also, really big thank you to all the audience who have been following along with the series. We hope this has been very informative and educational. Um, the full recording for this session, along with the slide deck, will be made available on IFMA's Coronavirus Resource Center. So please go to ifma.org slash coronavirus for this episode and all past episodes. Uh, big thank you again to everybody for participating in today's session, and please stay tuned for future episodes. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.